available. So the, the recorded webinar version will be available probably within about two to three days after the webinar finishes. And that is available on our website, on our membership pages under a menu called free webinars. We'll also be sending you the link in your follow-up email to this um, webinar. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it over and introduce to you Paul Brown, who's known as Mr. Retention, and uh, is the president and CEO of Face to Face Retention, and he goes all over the world presenting. So we're very happy to have you, and thank you very much. Paul, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Sharon. And firstly, good afternoon to all of our friends up there in Canada, and uh, I very much appreciate you taking the time to join us today. I'm going to talk first about today's objective. The, the Retain, Grow and Prosper title talks about the fact that health clubs have a, a great opportunity to build their membership uh, by helping their members be more successful. So what I talk about today is going to help you to really get people off to a great start when they join your clubs and make sure they stick with the fitness habit. You know, the, the business of getting people fit is really all about helping them change their lives. They get you from one sort of lifestyle looking to transition into what is probably more typical of the lifestyle that you yourself follow. Uh, and unfortunately in our health club industry there's varying models on how clubs have the time allocated to take care of their members. I'm going to give you a little bit of time today and share with you the psychological, the emotional challenges that all members go through and some of the business strategies that you need to employ if you're going to get people off to a great start and then maintain regular contact with them in a way that you would do with, with, with any family member or any relationship that you're trying to establish. So really today's objective will be to highlight some of the challenges members go through, show some strategies you you can employ, out of doubt, give you an opportunity to ask questions of me. So again, as Erin said, please take the time to write in those chat questions. The webinar format is always a little more challenging than us being together in a room like we might do at a Canfit Pro conference, but it also opens up new opportunities. Uh, imagine 10 years ago someone saying that you're going to sit down and listen to a presenter who in his country it's 3.30 in the morning, in your country it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, are literally halfway around the world from each other and you're, you're going to be able to communicate directly and openly. If someone said you 10 years ago, you would think, wow, that's, that's, that's science fiction, that's impossible. And yet later, here we are today. When people come into your health clubs with goals and needs and aspirations, they can't see 10 years ahead. They can't see themselves living a more active lifestyle and, and watching their kids grow up and participating in sports and activities that they would never have dreamt possible ability to create a whole new future for people. But there has to be a strategy from day one that outlines how that's going to occur. And so again, my intention today is to open your eyes to some of the things that are out there and perhaps reinforce some of the messages that you've heard before and have already applied. I think the thing we should do today is to absolutely be clear on what retention is, how we measure it. Now this is a little bit of retention Y1, um, but in basic terms, most health clubs have already got an established membership, unless you are planning on opening a club in the near future. But when you do, hopefully you'll open up with a base of membership, whether that's from a pre-sale or the acquisition of another membership. Let's just say for my example here, this club has 2,000 memberships. And so two fellows there represent the 2,000. They start, let's say, at the beginning of the year, and then throughout the year they sell an additional number of memberships. So they started with 2,000, let's say for argument's sake they acquired another 2,000. Theoretically, 100% of their membership pool represents the combination of those two numbers, for my example's case. Well, retention would be, how many members do we have this time last year, how many do we have now, a percentage of the total number of members we could have had had we kept all the ones we sold. Tip club, you might say that we lost 20% over that period. Research has suggested that that number is closer to 60%. So we started with 2,000, we added 2,000 memberships, but we lost deal members over that period of time. What would be the cause of that? That's some of the things we're going to discuss today. Bring retention as a percentage of our potential total membership pool. That would be possibly measuring attrition. Certainly with today's billing techniques, you know, a lot of clubs are doing weekly, weekly or monthly billing. So they start with a certain number of memberships at the beginning of the month, and then throughout that month, people choose to either cancel their membership, make billing system fails, and they don't don't, don't uh, clear it up, or simply do not choose to extend their contact with you. So let's say for every hundred members, you lose eight of those members each month. Well, that's you've got eight members that you need to replace just to hold 
balance. Now, a lot of jobs lose eight every month, so that means the holes continue to come into business. That's why they have such a busy and market department. So, uh, what's all they're going to cost you? Well, that's simple mathematics. Um, if you imagine that every time you lose a member, you lose at least one year's worth of membership, that would be a fairly good place to start. $50 a month times $2. Every member you lose straight away, you could probably fully say you lose $600 from that member. What they spent? What the fact that they're not your club buying drinks, buying taking advantage of your tanning services, your massage, buying cans, personal training products. They've also stopped referring their friends and family. There's people in their office that they're off to the gym. They're passing on your guest passes and referral passes. So lose a member. You don't lose one month of billing. You lose every single dollar you could have collected from that person for the rest of their life. Now it might only add up to be a few months worth of membership because they were going to move out of town anyway. But if you multiply every member you lose by 12 months worth of billing, you start to get a small idea of the pain that a trend can cause a club. What is me is that 30 years into the industry's development around the world, we will tend to put a lot more time, energy, money and investment into our sales and marketing efforts as if member acquisition is the key and the lifeblood to membership growth. That's half of the challenge and in fact, we know, we know that every dollar we spend on retaining a client pays much faster than any we spend on sales and marketing. We're running down the drain. One more time, that example. If Club A had a thousand members at the start of 2009, they had 700 memberships throughout that year of last year. Theoretically, they should have 1,700 members. But here we are at the start of 2010, they've got 1,050. A very modest growth. This is a typical example of clubs that I see across Canada. Well, that means they've lost 650 members over that year. The bucks a month, that's $390,000 just in dues alone, plus lost secondary spend, referral, etc. So there's a lot of money at stake here, but to my original idea as a, as, a, as, a, as a fitness instructor whose mission is to help people get healthy, and for most of you people out there come from a similar background, that's 150 people who put themselves in our hands and said, get me fit, fit and that way. It's a fairly major slug of our membership quitting sales. And with money, whether you're in it for the personal satisfaction of saving lives, we want to see that fitness word spread around the world, that continue, not at that rate. We see organizations tumble and there'll be more to go if we rely on a sales and churning model. And model, you talk about a cultural choice. This little angle here can represent a number of different ways of running our business. The very top of the peak there, the one that seems to have spearheaded the health club growth over the last 30 odd years, is that sales driven culture. It's opening up a club, going in with an aggressive sales and marketing strategy. I agree this is necessary. I'm not against sales and marketing, not, not at all. It's an important part of it. But there's a lot of people out there who that's all their focus is sell, sell, sell. Now, there's a limited lifespan. Actually, the consumers either round you become so saturated in the marketplace that it gets harder to find people who haven't been bought a membership for. It's a situation where you have to keep reducing your costs to make the consumer interested in what you're selling. Now, the middle part, the bill for supremacy through facilities, well, that's an ending. You constantly add more equipment in. You can constantly build and expand the size of your club, trying to compete with other operators who are always doing the same thing. It's hit for tad affair of Who's got the bigger, best club? It's been a nightclub or a restaurant competition. There seems to be a lot of people willing to throw money at being the big top dog. Very rarely do those people ever retain that top dog position forever. And more importantly, they don't seem to get the same financial returns. The real foundation of any membership is loyal group members. They are, I doubt, your most powerful asset. Now, imagine. If you have a good, effective sales and marketing culture, we have professional people who are able to convert inquiries into memberships and also upsell those inquiries into more expanded options. 
not a plan. What if you can maintain good, solid facilities, nice equipment, keep the place looking fresh, and also have a loyal, grateful member base. You get three things together, you can't be big and necessarily have a huge sales force out there. You foundation of loyal, grateful members. That's the place to start, not the place to finish. And we're loyal foundation of members. And we'll talk about attrition. When we talk about membership retention, we stand that there's really going to be two distinct categories. I find these simply as controllable, controllable. Uh, that I carry around in my wallet. My father gave it to me at a very young age, it's known as a prayer of serenity. And it says, Lord, give me the strength to change things I can, the to accept the things I cannot, and the to know the difference. There are some things we have control over, and there are some things we simply have to let happen. Well, a member living in your town, moving away to live in a new area, and have a club in that area, that's uncontrollable. You can do nothing about that. A member who gets absolutely destitute financially cannot afford any, any products over and above the basic needs of food and clothing and housing. These would be uncontrollable for you. But relatively rare. Yes, there is a population moving out of your town on a regular basis, but it's a lot less than imported on your enough in my area, about 7% of the population leave town at any given year. 30% of members who quit a club in this region do not leave because they're moving. People are regularly moving six times more often than unfit people, but it just doesn't add up. The reason a lot of supposedly uncontrollable excuses coming across your desk for cancellation, it really could drill down and find out the truth. There will be a controllable failure earlier on. On, where the person stopped using the club, therefore is looking for a way out. Stop using their workouts, stopped following up the advice that they were supposed to have taken on board. Something failed early on, and now they're telling you there's nothing that can be done. Read that fitness is an essential part of people's lives. We know we've got to breathe, we've got to eat, we have to exercise. It's a requirement to look after our body. You and I are absolutely adamant that exercise is non-negotiable, then join your club, should be a member until an absolute uncontrollable occurrence. And that should be roughly 2% per month, not 8% per month. 0.3% higher transition rate, but it is not 8% or 5% and what the industry is living with right now. We've got to do getting people to be as passionate about their exercise lifestyle as we are, to make it always fit, no matter how busy they get, and to always find the financial investment, which quite frankly, I doubt there's a club sitting in today that charges much more than 3 or $4 a day to be a member. That's about a coffee. Be money. It's received value. Why are they walking away on us? Number one, of course, is time, and a legitimate problem. People are busy. You know, we want people to come to our clubs that can afford us. Therefore, they've probably got a job or they do something that their money in check. They've probably got family or friends or hobbies. There's other things that people need to do as well as fitness. We can't expect them to live in the clubs the way some of us have done in it. I bet this webinar today that's been an hour and a half, two hours a day exercising because they we're lining up, we can expect them to be passionate and time open as we are. We don't want them to become fanatical about our exercise. We want them to fit in the non negotiable minimum. So it is a reason people quit. And what that means is we have to be respectful of their time and teach them the most time efficient techniques possible. Now the big one. You know, it's interesting. I live in Australia, Southern Hemisphere. In January It's not. Certainly parts of Canada are white in January. If you join a health club, you know, in January it is very warm. So where I live is very hot. 
gym, lots of people join health clubs. It's not because it's winter that they go to the gym and they're all heading indoors for you guys, and certainly it's not because of the summer here. What it is, of course, is the start of a fresh year. It's making a commitment to get it right. Now, by me, the very same people tend to drop off. I mapped all over the world that five months after people join is when they're most likely to show a drop in their exercise habits. Say, oh, that's because of the weather's warming up, the snow's melting, people getting outside, they don't need the gym anymore. Plus, it's also May, but it's starting to get cooler. Right now, the temperature's dropping here, and so is membership attendance. It's got nothing to do with the temperature and everything to do with this pattern of getting started in the early part of the year, getting excited about getting fit, and then slowly losing momentum, losing, losing hope, losing focus, losing the habit. They believed that fitness was a non-negotiable part of their life. They would do it 52 weeks a year, times of year more often than others. And certainly when they start to go outdoors, then that would be a time maybe to do less indoor cardio work for example, but you can move away from a regular exercise habit. People get because they don't believe that fitness is a all your responsibility. They think they turn it on for a while, turn it off again. The problem the industry has created for itself is a hard cell culture. I'm not sure the clubs out there, but it is and has become a prevalent problem. But we sell memberships. And in many markets, we're selling membership for less now in real terms than we did 5, 10, 20 years ago. In fact, in real terms, we're probably selling memberships far less now than we did in the heydays of the 80s when the industry was first finding its feet. Why we substituted that membership revenue is using additional secondary revenue. One of personal training. Hey, it's a product. Personal training is a great service. But what seems to be evolving is that members are being invited in to buy memberships at relatively low prices and then very early on being beat over the head with a tire iron in an attempt to sell them the package the clubs are after. And this is creating a problem for us because what we're now getting is clients avoiding seeing with a trainer because they don't want to go through a sales pitch. Uh, talk about the car industry and uh, how professional they are at selling, but they also got themselves a bad rap. Um, and you know, if everybody who bought a car knew they were going to be forced buying mag wheels the day after they bought the car, there'd be a lot less people wanting to sit down with that salesperson. PTL, yes, it makes sense to press PT. Yes, it makes sense to offer it, but it is becoming a bit of a barrier for some people. Isolation, without doubt, being on the gym floor, being on your own, feeling that you have no one there for support, that major cause of quitting. Very often getting reports from people saying that when they first joined, they thought they were going to be offered plenty of help at the beginning. All they really offered was a PT package. When they chose not to buy that, it meant they were pretty well left to their own devices. So that isolation can lead with some real buyer's remorse. And of course, that lack of direction. They're not clear on what they should be doing themselves. They thought the membership would come with sufficient guidance, and it just wasn't there. The other people have had exercise for quite some time, and they become bored. Uh, with some phenomena in the industry of the smaller club model, with limited exercise choices, in some cases uh, circular circuits and the like, which are a very easy entry path, but quickly can become boring. Or join a big club, be given one program, and never an opportunity to modify or evolve on that program. Same risk, boredom. I've also seen many, many times people who've worked out for many, many years falling into the rut of just getting on a piece of cardio and just trying to go through the motions day in, day out, because that's what they believe was the best option for them. One stimulus for the mind is just as important as for the body. Most common unknown reason people quit is a lot of results. Today, as in your class, was sold to somebody who came in looking around and asking to achieve something, whether it was loss, getting up, getting fit. Maybe said, I want to get married and I want to feel my best on the day. Maybe said, I'm going to go on a holiday and I want to wear favorite swimsuit. What it was, they came to us and said, here's where my life is right now and it's not good enough. Help me, propel me to a newer, better me. And what salesperson say? Of course we can. That's what we do here. You come to the right place. Great to say. 
that member will probably have some type of fitness appraisal, maybe. They may have some type of measurements done, whether it's at the first meeting with a personal trainer or as part of your induction system. So come in, ask about membership, how much is it to join, how do I achieve my results? We sell this, we get them statistically, 10% of members who buy a membership ever see any documented results. And quite generous there, it's probably less than 1%. I don't know that for certain because I'm not sure there's been any real heavy data done on this. But when I ask the question time and time again in seminars around the world, I the audience, hold hand up if you know for certain the members you signed in January have now in May or April or May seen measured results. No hand up. It's very rare I see that. On today's webinar might be the cream of the crop. You're interested in this topic, so you're already doing stuff. If you congratulations, but if your members aren't seeing documented results within eight to twelve weeks of them joining, which is being again very generous, you promise and a solution, but at time are you being held accountable or more importantly, celebrating with the client what they've achieved? Don't rely on anecdotal evidence. Don't rely on someone saying, Hey, I feel better, I know I do. I have no idea what my results are, but that's okay. I just know it's worth it. worth it. People on the fence out there to let it get out of the way. You have to sit down and say, you know what? You joined a club, you came feeling like this, and now this is how you feel. You came looking like this, and now this is how you look. You came performing at this level, and now here's what you've achieved. Because from there, you board to what's next. You could say, what else is possible? Now, the team makes a lot of sense. Because you help me get to a certain point, I want, and the best way to do that is with a coach or a trainer. If I don't want that coach or trainer, at least I know that the membership is a critical part of me looking and feeling the way I chose to. So because they're busy, they believe in fitness the way we do, they don't want to be hard sold on products over and above their membership right away, they don't like being left alone, well not most of them anyway, they like to have direction. But it has emulating at the same time, and most importantly, they want to see how it's working. This is what they see. This is what they see for themselves. The perfect outcome. I would like to look and feel like the Adonis. And of course, that's that many of them are living with. And it's worse and every day. So we don't let people walk around feeling like the guy on the right. We walk and feel like the guy on the left. Put some clothes on, I'd say. This brings us as well, the difference between hospitality and service. A long way our members want to feel important that you know by name. They feel that you are attentive to their needs. Uh, and that it's, it's great to have a friendly, bubbly reception. It's great to have members who are being acknowledged. Hi, great to see you again. Thanks for coming in. The occasional phone call or email or letter communicating to them. This is all relatively standard hospitality. What about really is serving their needs, finding out what it is that's held them back from living a healthier lifestyle in the past and helping them through those barriers. That's serving their needs. So let's not think for a moment that all this is about making people feel warm and fuzzy by handshakes, by smiles, by eye contact. They're the gifts, they're the things we expect from a professional business. I'm talking about saying as a and fitness provider, we're going to give you what you came for. This we need to understand. Uh, this graph here represents the beginning stages of their membership, the first couple of months. That's what those little vertical lines are. They represent one month per of the membership lifespan. So you can see there that the red phase lasts about two months. Then the orange phase lasts one, two, three, four, five, six months thereabouts. And the green phase, well, there's, all, there's an arrow on the right-hand side which depicts that that's the ongoing membership for life. Most are living in the green zone. You work out regularly, you like the gym, you're confident when you work out, you've got your favourite classes, your favourite attendances, you're in the groove, you know your comfort. You've got lots of friends who fall in the same category. Many of your members are your friends. They you well, you have their children and you're just having conversations the way you would with a buddy from school. How you're in a health club is that all members feel that way. That all members are in that member for life zone. They're coming and going at will. They know that the club's always there and they take advantage of it. They might have a few days off here or there, 
you know what? They are regularly using the delivery because they know they must. That means zone. When you are up, they don't automatically jump into that green zone. They've got to go through a journey. The first months are the scariest. In those two months, they have three specific needs. They need advice, support, and resilience. They right off the bat someone to say, hey, I know what you want, I know where you're at now, we are going to take charge, we are going to show you and teach you what to do. Follow my advice because I've been down this path, I know exactly the safest way to get where you want to get to. So, recognizing that the members won't just do it on their own. You have to be willing to say, hey, I'm sure you do this and if you fall over, I'll pick you up. And else, with that red face, need some positive feedback, some encouragement. Any parents can relate a lot to this. The early lives of a child are three very things. Advice, support, results. You just learn to walk. Coaching, but something will need your support. The result, of course, they start to walk. Brush teeth, same thing. When teenagers learning to drive a car, something, our lives are dotted with times when we needed someone who knew what they were doing to teach us how. Someone to say when we falter that it's okay, let's get you back up. And to say, look, look you made congratulations. Get to that point, we then hit the evolving stage. At this point, we want to sure the person doesn't get bored or stuck in a rut and can now start to interact more about when it's appropriate to get members interacting and communicating and, and just basically mixing with, with other members. You know, we let people like to socialize. And I'm realizing here, some people do like to just do it all on their own and are very independent. But the non-members in clubs right now, this whole aspect of it is important. But the time when they're ready for social interaction. If you throw a group situation back in the red phase where they feel that their steam is not at its peak yet, where in other words, they just feel lost and they're not quite sure they belong. That can actually make the problem worse because they feel somewhat intimidated. They feel somewhat left out because they don't match up with everyone else. But when those first couple of months, when they develop that confidence, when they see that they can enjoy this, they're now ready to openly interact with other members. So now's the time to introduce more, more group interaction and just basically meeting other people. Of of course is the program's got to get more advanced or the program has to at least teach them more variety so they're not just on railway tracks going in circles round and round and round. They need the ability to expand. And then the learning phase is the member for life phase. That's the key word you have to embrace. Members feel like they belong to a club or they simply pay a subscription. And that's a huge difference between what we can offer in our business and putting up a box selling access keys to the door. Instead of selling access keys to the door, you'll find retention a major challenge. There's some evolving around the world right now that are relatively small sized clubs, supposedly requiring no staffing, people 24 access. And yes, they are growing very, very rapidly. But would you they are suffering, by my understanding, the same, if not worse, retention challenges than some clubs. Because the decision to go no staff, low interaction, no support is really them because these people still need to get to red phase. They still need to get through the orange phase. If I run a gym myself that gives me that type of access with zero help, I'll be fine because I'll be training all my life. But for and I, we are the minority. We are less than 10% of the population that we could be selling to. And so some members that love that concept, but when bring their friends and family to that very same club that aren't fit right now, there's no pathway for the red, there's no pathway for the orange, there's going to be a massive churning scenario. So whether you're a box or a small club, you have an obligation to respect and interact with members through these different three ages. That brings back to getting off to a great start. And getting start really is that first 30 days have multiple one-on-one -on -one contacts, face-to-face -face as we call it, and each of those contacts teaches the client how to get to the next stage. That for us has proven to be the most successful model. 
Now, different variations on how you can do this, but you generally go with the concept of one third contact per week that is a structured consultation where the client gets the advice, that coach is there to support them, and that they see results. By the time they see the results and the forcing of the habit of coming back to the club again and again and again, you have someone now who really believes and understands exercise the way you do. Of course, their learning hasn't ended, but you've got to a great start. From that, they can springboard onto PT and other programs. But if you've educated them at the beginning well, and support them through those first 30, 60 days, you've got a much more open opportunity to help them evolve. I recommend that once they get through the AMBER stage, they are a coach maybe once every 8 to 12 weeks. By the the majority of members will either abort PT, take up occasional coaching, or quite frankly become so independent they really don't need it. But the needs that I can check in with a coach every 8 to 12 weeks, that that's included in my membership, is a very, very important part of me knowing the club has a continued interest in my success. And as trainers, if you meet one every 8 to 12 weeks to review their progress, that's another opportunity to always say to them, hey, you're using the club pretty well like you're riding a bus. If you want a limousine ride, I can take you place you never imagined possible. We can do ways together you could never do on your own. I can be monitoring and following your progress much more closely. That's our private or personal training pages. Time that is after you've proved to them at the beginning, you're willing to tip them. Calls are an important part. We recommend confirmation calls. In fact, in our systems, it becomes a relatively automated process of confirming each appointment and making sure the client is looking forward to it. Today we have a bunch of people signed on to a webinar. Everybody is signed on today. We have more people who planned or registered for the webinar than they show up. I'm offended by that. That's standard. I expect a couple of people to forget, get busy or other things. We could have phoned every single person, let's say 12 hours beforehand, and said, hey, don't forget the webinar at this time. Here's what you're going to cover. Here's what you need. Attendance goes up. Now, 100 appointments this week, you struggle getting 100%. If you call and confirm the appointments the night before, a simple thing like that, not only does your show rate go up, the phone calls themselves become part of the relationship building stage. It's like you met somebody for the first time in your life. For those of you out there who are not married, you are married. You can think back to when it very began, when it first started. Started, where you and your significant other went to the movies, went to dinner, went for a picnic, went sailing. It was a pre-arranged consultation. But in consultations, those dates, those meetings, were the odd call. The calls help form part of the relationship. They don't have to be very long, but what they be, for. they may be genuine. They certainly need to have a purpose. Later day, a printed letter occasionally can be very, very powerful. The world's changing. We're using a lot more other techniques now to communicate. In fact, we're saving trees by not printing too often. But a welcome letter, a birthday card, a joining letter, fit in your hand is a very dear way to maintain a relationship or develop a relationship. And with the wonderful world of emails, we're able to shoot out messages periodically. But two things to say about email. It's great to communicate. I personally use it every day and thank God for email. But you can do anything by email. I can't learn how to sail a boat by email. I can't learn how to drive a car by email. I can't learn how to fly a plane by email. The only skill is from one who already knows how. Advice in the club, on the floor, coaching, support, being there with them, and results. Looking in the eye and saying, wow, you did it. Look what you achieved. Now what would you like? Use email as a support or backup to the two face interaction that our clubs can provide. We do not use it as a poor substitution. 
you selling out somebody, here's what we want you to do and how to do it, and that's your reliant method of retaining them, you'll be category real fast. So it's a tool that you must use wisely so it doesn't become overused. We graduate the members once they get through the red phase. In all these techniques, the regular interaction at the beginning, the phone call confirmations, the letters, and the occasional email. But then get them back as a group now and celebrate what they've achieved early on. In our graduation every month where we bring the new members who have been through our programs and we say, look what you've achieved, here's a certificate, here's a t-shirt, and now we get them to interact and talk to each other because now they're over their fears. They want to talk about their experiences and they want to motivate and encourage others. Purely, we educate members through seminars, another great way to bring people together. People will show up to a seminar because they're very interested in the topic and quite frankly will show up just for the social interaction. But if you have some, some, some food, some drinks provided before and after the seminar, it's an excuse to bring people together. The graduation is an excuse to bring people together. Likewise, we blitz the floor with results days, walking around the floor and giving people on the spot quick measurements and checkups, on the spot program reviews. Not really them to approach our teams and making appointments, but crossing off the diary, keeping it clear, leaving the floor and saying, hey, today's results day, let's check how you're doing so far. And you spend every member, not just aim members that your staff chat to every day. That white girl in the corner who very rarely asks for any help. That guy you don't even know, but he's been with you for years. The results are a great way to blitz and contact everybody. And then once a year, I encourage you to disgrace yourselves at the biggest, wildest party you can throw. At a club to get everybody together. One year where we all let our hair down, whether it's dress, whether it's themed, or whether it's just a formal event. One year, do it for your club anniversary, or do it for a major holiday that you have. Do it as a fundraiser, if you will. Make a charity a major part of your club, and then once a year, have a fundraiser for them. But every single member and every friend that they've got should want to be at that party. So year-round calendar we've created. At the very beginning, more contacts of advice, support, results, coaching, built into the price of the membership, not an optional extra. Then periodical program updates to make sure that the client can evolve and get a new program and see how they're doing. The ability to buy personal training packages but not pushing it too hard at the beginning the regular phone calls to confirm some of these contacts, the occasional letter to tell them how important they are to us, and email to provide support education, support information, and small tidbits that they can use quickly, but not relying on that being the only way to communicate. Have graduation to celebrate their success, offering occasional seminars, offering occasional floor blitzes, and then running an annual party. That is a year-round plan to find and keep these members so you can grow, retain, prosper as they grow and prosper. Once you looked, the engagement of the relationship becomes a lot easier. You have to keep seeing them on a regular basis once they become hooked on the club. In fact, they might be stalking them if you try to. What we've got them off to a great start. Now, we want to have some private interaction with them, some community interaction. And that's on some of these. There are flags you can have. Privately, we use card colours to know where each member's up to. The workout cards are colour coded. So the cards suggest that they've just gotten started. Different colour cards show us how they've evolved. If they've evolved well, the colour might be green. If they're struggling, the colour might be orange. These colors are flags that our trainers on the floor can instantly recognize, and it gives them something of a clue of how to go. Three messages on our front screen, whether it's through your software, but as people are arriving, these little prompts help you build that relationship. Everyone from the happy birthday to, hey, don't forget you've got an appointment coming up, to, a, oh, by the way, this is your second last training session. Make sure you don't miss out on having your coach next week. Let's get you renewed on your package. Or emails and SMSs. Just to remind people of certain and recent events 
absolutely helpful. Progression states we've already mentioned about every eight to twelve weeks. Risk checks as part of that. Show them what they've achieved so far and rewards. You've set them a goal to get to the twelve week mark. You want to do X number of workouts in that period. When they get there, have something to reward them with. Some little tiny thing. Uh, the room that I'm in right now doing my webinar, I look across my right hand shoulder, I can see a chart up on the wall. The chart has a whole heap of stars on it. This is for my five year old boy. There's a few things my wife and I are trying to coach our little five year old boy to do. Wash his teeth regularly without being told. His room tidy so the toy goblin doesn't steal his toys. Eating his healthy foods that we put in front of him. We give him a star on the chart every time he accomplishes one of these great little milestones. Guess what happens when he gets enough stars on the chart? He cries at five years of age. There are lots of ways to make a little boy smile. A little toy, a little DD, a little game. Uh, or a visit to a certain place that he just loves going to. So he knows when he does certain small behaviours, he's rewarded. And when those small behaviours add up, he gets a reward. Now, for five year old kids, it's the reason it might work for 20 grown ups or 65 year old grown ups. Respond well when someone gives us small rewards along the way and that we have a big thing to ask. Another way of maintaining that private engagement. Uh, once again, I fully believe in PT as a great way to continue successful results for our clients. But can't be bashed over the head that that's the only way to be successful in the health club. If you're only interested in selling PT, be a PT studio. But if your club is a membership club open for your open usage, it's got to become one of many ways to be successful at the club. <coughs> Pardon me. Yes, that every single stage is measured and monitored. Measure how many people you sign up start on your new member journey. Measure how many people keep their appointments. How many people have their next appointment booked. They're critical statistics. How many people graduate all through the program? At what stages did they get to? Did everybody get all the way? Did some people drop off? Did they get through in the time frame we wanted them to get, get through? These should be measured and monitored. What reasons for them coming in? Are we attracting people who have a goal of weight loss, toning and thing? This isn't just marketing research. This drives your exercise prescription choices. This drives your equipment purchase choices. This drives the imagery that you use in your marketing. This drives the language you use in your referral campaigns. Understanding what people's goals are. And then your attracts a certain kind of population more often than any other. That is what you need to be given. I think clubs are pleasantly surprised to discover that the people have when they come into the club are relatively do doable. Coming in to say they want to look good, they want to lose weight, they want to tone up. But they tell us conclusively the best thing about our club is not how great it makes them look. It's how does them feel? Walking and saying, I want to lose 30 pounds. I want to have a, a nice muscular physique. I want a six pack. That reason they join. They come for vanity, but they for health. So later they realize they're never going to look quite the way those girls in the magazine look. They're never going to quite have that body of those movie stars. The things that they thought they wanted to be, the day they realize they're not quite going to get there is also the day they realize it doesn't matter because a bunch of other reasons to do it. You feel like a movie star. You can feel like a million dollar athlete. You may not medal at the Olympics, but you can smile just as often as an athlete. We measure this. We measure their improvements in stress management, their improvements in how much more energetic they feel, their improvements in their ability to wake up after a good night's sleep or lesser sleep. Right, so getting close to 
four, what was it here in Australia? It's almost five o'clock in the morning. I've been talking now for about 50 minutes. I don't normally get out of bed at three o'clock in the morning to run webinars, but I'm fantastic doing it, partly because yesterday I did a great workout. Stressed and tired and not working out regularly, you need more sleep and even then you struggle getting out of bed. To work out regularly, start to need less sleep. Do you do that? Do you say to a client at the beginning, hey, how hard is it to get out of bed in the morning? And six weeks later, now how hard is it to get out of bed? Difference in you? You know what? You're bonding better, yearning up, you're efficient. You don't need as much horizontal time because of the way you work out during your waking hours. The things people need to see in front of them. Wow, you're right. I used to be this and now I'm that. that. That very powerful reinforcement of what they brought them to And then at the end of our early journey, we ask them to rate what their experience has been like. like think of your consultations with your coaches, the information sheets we gave you, the audio CD you listened to. What do you think of the trainer knowledge? Were we punctual in our service of you at the front desk? Do you now think membership represents value for money? What are our facilities? Are you happy with the quality of the equipment? The staff friendly? Is the club clean? How classes? How have you experienced your social interaction? How people rate us at the end of our early journey once they get through the red phase? And it's amazing to see such scores. Now I've got we've got clubs work with all over the world that I would never call clean. They try hard, but they have big volumes of numbers, and you know it only takes ten minutes and it's clean looks used. It's possible to have a club perfectly clean. And I love that they don't even try to keep it clean. Interestingly enough, our members are still happy because they're getting results and they're feeling loved and they're feeling acknowledged. Maybe love is a powerful word for some of you this time of day, but they do feel like they belong. So they're less likely to complain. But if you're screaming at you that they're not happy that they're clean, is done properly. If you get a client who notices there's some dust under a treadmill and points it out to you, they're not really complaining about that. What they're really expressing is an efficiency in themselves. When people about themselves, they don't want to pick others to bits. If you have someone picking others to bits, it's because they see faults in themselves. People successfully early on, and they'll think you're the million dollar dollar. But if they're willing, they're going to allow they're going to the equipment's broken down, they can never get in classes, and I had to wait five minutes to get checked in today. What's going on with this place? If they're feeling good about who they are, they let all the other stuff slide. Out here, when we want to retain, grow, and prosper, is an approach. First, the right service. We journey, we have a pathway for new members to come into our club and be successful. We have an education process to teach you exactly what to do so you have no questions unanswered. That now becomes a great marketing tool. Hey, you join the club, you're not alone. You can see results. When marketing message goes out there, it is reinforced with sales team. The team have got something to talk about other than price. And I am sick to death of watching market after market self-destruct around the world because of discounting kings. It's happened just about every evolving market I've ever worked in. The United States began it, invented it, and it's a plague that continues to spread. If you're in a price war, the only way to win is to thank people to come out. But you, when you get the point, so it's worth every dollar you charge. That's why your marketing message comes be about price and has to be about benefit, has to be about outcomes, has to be about meeting people's needs. That's the message. And the good news is when your service strategy is in place and it's solid, what you promise is what you deliver, therefore what you deliver becomes your, your reputation. True, true path success is to be known for being good at what you say you do. You might really be varying things from getting off to a strong start and you imagery to to different people. That message there clearly talks to different people than that there. And text is the exact same text. 
something strong. Everybody wants to look and feel their best. We take it slowly. Our face-to-face -face program delivers guaranteed results. It's the perfect path to better health fitness. Whatever your goals are, give your body the best possible start with face program. So you can see the imagery changes, the message is the same. Dex it up, less is more. We know you're busy. You don't have a lot of time into our club. In fact, we use the most time efficient techniques. So you might be busy, but you're never too busy to look at yourself. More you wait, that's the most popular goal we have in health clubs. Well, you're going to need more help. You get successful strategies. So come to our team, we'll be on. Life's too short to just fumble along on any old program. So what you're able to do, ladies and gentlemen, when you have a good path to success is use it as a reason to join your club and not one of these campaigns means money. They are the biggest untapped market still to this day and it's growing every day. The single most important message we want to get out there is the whole idea of joining a gym or health club is that you shouldn't have to go alone. Not get that, but we do. So the people, we have a path to get you off to a great start. You're really telling them won't have to go alone. So just to the final point before we take questions, and then believe what is the value of each member. It's impossible to calculate, but this little pine cone says it all. Pine cone has 200 seeds in that pine cone. At the time, the tree that pine cone comes from will have a million seeds on it. Statistics we're told that only one of those million seeds will ever become a tree. The pine cone is from a sequoia tree, the world's largest and oldest trees on the planet. And they are 300 feet tall. I think they are some 35 to 40 feet across at the base. There's wood in one to build an entire community of houses. And it came from that little tiny seed in that little tiny pine cone. Which of your members will spend the most amount of money? So you better one of them. Questions, so I'm going to hand it back over to Erin. Erin, have you got any questions that have been typed in yet, please? Hi, thank you, Paul. No, um, just uh, buddy, if you do have a question, you want to raise your hand, feel welcome to do that, or you can type your question into the question box and uh, forward that over, and we can um, take a look at that. So I'll give uh, everybody a second or two if there's see if anybody has any questions to move forward with. Add to that, Erin, this webinar format it's it's certainly a new technology that a lot of people are getting familiar with. Uh, so the concept of typing in a question and, and it may just feel a little bit disjointed or a little disconnected there. But again, this technology allows us to have these kind of meetings from all over the world. So everybody out there, think of the think of the way you can embrace this technology and get comfortable with it. I'm sure as time goes by, you become more and more familiar with it. CanFit Pro will be running these seminars on a regular basis. And I think this, this form of education that CanFit Pro are providing is just a wonderful evolution and a perfect example of everything I've discussed today about how we first try something new, it feels a bit strange and a bit awkward, but with frequency, with regularity, and someone giving us a little bit of help, it becomes commonplace. So once again, just think, what could I do to make the most of this technology? That's the same question your members are asking every day. Thanks very much, Paul. I, we do have one raised hand from Jeanette, and then we'll get to Dawn. Um, so I'm just going to unmute Jeanette and see if we can listen to her question. Yes, hi. Um, hi, Jeanette. Can you hear me? Yep, Jeanette, we hear hi. you. Hi. Um, my, my question is that I live in a very small community, um, and around us we have other little small, we're in the country, um, but we have new openings of different places that are offering like a free three months or uh, lose weight with us for three months or six months and get you know get the whole thing paid off I can't compete with these people um, I have a small gym from home I do personal training but I also have a very open concept um, I use a lot of um, the clips that was just discussed uh, by Paul um, but still, I mean my I, membership is definitely down quite a bit, and so I, I just don't know where to go from now. Well, firstly, thank you for your question. You might remember the triangle that I showed. In fact, I'm going to uh, 
jump out real quick and go back to this slide here. Remember that I've got that three stages there. What you're saying is you do have a loyal, grateful membership base, but what you're losing the battle in is the battle of equipment and facilities. You are being competing now with clubs who, rightly or wrongly, that they also have a way of making their members successful, but they've got facilities which obviously are going to be bigger than your home. If you're working from home, you're always going to have a limited client base. But what really, the product for you is you. People are choosing Jeanette because they like Jeanette. So you, you really are the most important asset you've got. That's one of the limitations and restrictions of choosing to be a home business. You're always going to be much smaller uh, size and turnover than the larger operations. So you've got to make a decision. Do you want to continue to be a small home operating business? And if so, accept the fact that some people will leave you because they've now decided they want to go and do, work out where there's a wider variety of options available to them. Really means is, Jeanette, you're going to be forced to probably charge a premium price for your service so you feel rewarded for your time. Uh, that again is going to help limit and filter out who your real clients are. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I just have one more question in terms of um, I, I try. The, actually, it's it's, um, it's like people almost have to come here to understand how everything functions. Uh, I teach classes every night. We have yoga teachers coming in every night. It's, it's sort of similar to a larger uh, gym, except it's all compressed into a small one. Um, I do have uh, cardio equipment. We teach free weights. We have circuit training. Um, so we, I really try, and, and I have personal training, so I try and fit that in. Um, but of course, I'm only one person. I can't afford to have somebody else financially um, to come in and, and help me out. Uh, so the people who come in and teach for the yoga, for example, well, my members will pay them, but I don't. I don't charge the yoga the, the yoga teachers uh, to use the, the the gym. You just have to be able to provide uh, the, the opportunity for the people to you know and, and um, have something else other than what I can offer in the gym. Um, so I don't know if I'm spreading myself out too thin, if I need to just regenerate and rethink of uh, regroup myself and think exactly uh, making it smaller, um, I'm not quite sure from there. Well, this bit of information tells me you must have a bigger home than the first impression I got. So you're big enough to have the studio and the equipment and the facility. So uh, it's clearly this isn't just in your garage by the sounds of it. No, it isn't. I have a huge basement, so uh, yeah, I would. No, I even have an office, so it's quite a, a big uh, space. Yeah, yeah, it still has the. I'm going to use the word stigma because I can't think of a more positive word to use, but it still has the feeling of we're going to Jeanette's house, and you know that that always has a degree of a barrier. In some ways, that's appealing to people. It's almost saying I'm trying to have a larger multi-service offering. Which, which is what people kind of want when they're looking for a professional facility, and yet you're doing it in an environment of your home where in some ways they can actually feel a bit awkward, if you don't mind me saying, to go to someone's home for that kind of service. So I, I really do believe that, yes, the, your asset is you and the fact that you're inviting people into your private space, and that needs to have some degree of exclusivity and definitely a family kind of feel. That's what you need to aim for. In, in the small time I've got, there's probably a lot more questions than answers for you at this point in time, Jeanette. But, but most importantly, you can't compete head on on your facilities. The battle for supremacy through these facilities is always going to be won by the guy with the bigger wallet or the bigger facilities. You say, yeah. what is my strength? And my strength is I've got this exclusivity, I've got this privacy and this home thing. I will definitely not be letting younger instructors teaching classes in my home for free. Somewhere along the line, every single minute that there's exercise happening in your facility has to have some revenue for you. Otherwise, it's just draining from somewhere else. You should be teaching that class and making money from it, or they should be paying you a rental to be there so that there's worthwhile time for you. That question. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. And look, shoot me an email if you have any further questions. I'd love to help you out further. But, but number one, just remember your strength is that exclusivity, that privacy, that small feeling. That's what you've got to maximize. Hey, Eric, Very do good. we have any further questions yeah. there? Thank, thank you, Jeanette. Uh, yes, we do have. I've uh, forwarded two uh, typed in questions, one from Dawn, um, and I've forwarded that over to you. Yes. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not actually seeing that very well. It's a very small window on the okay. panel that I have, so I might uh, ask you to read that for yep. me, please. His question is, do you, do you use dues in addition to retention and attrition stats as a measure? 
Do I use do's? Do you use do's in addition to retention and attrition stats as a measure? Certainly, the, the, the bottom line of any business is its financial stability. Uh, EBIT, uh, uh, you know, is, it, it rules. So yes, one of the things we're obviously monitoring is what is our monthly or weekly or bi-weekly dues run. The question, that is one way of measuring the success of business. That's that word prosper in our title. To grow and retain is one thing, but to get more money to pay for our own lifestyles or the further development of our businesses, we need to prosper. We need to be profitable. So absolutely, the bottom line, you've got to be looking very closely at your profit and loss statements. You've got to be looking very closely at the dues run or the revenue you're generating. But only one part of the equation. So there are many, many key performance indicators that a business needs to keep an eye on. I would not say that in most of my retention discussions, we go to dues first. I would always say the first thing we count is how many members did we sign up, how many members did we lose. Because those losers represent the people, the lives that we've lost. And as I said to you earlier, it's not just the money we make month on that person when we lose, it's the money we could have made over the next one year, two years, five years, and every single dollar they could have spent on other products, and every single dollar their friends or family they should have referred could have spent. So foremost, I look at people, I look at lives, and then I look at the financial ramifications of excess or otherwise. Oh, uh, we have another question from Lawrence that says, is there any real value in a questionnaire that returns very strong or in brackets high results all the time? Is any real value in a questionnaire where it's nothing but great feedback? Well, first thing, I don't think that any questionnaire gives us 100% feedback. Uh, what, what I'm hearing from him uh, is, and here's my Aussie coming out, a little cynicism to suggest, well, we want to get the truth of how people feel. Uh, well, the truth is, if they're feeling good on just about everything we do, that's one good indicator. But let me show you what I do as a, as a leader and as a presenter. I don't look at the highs. On this graph here, the member feedback averages, what this shows, this, this is a graph representing the scores of scores out of 10 for literally tens of thousands of people who have gone through our journey at the end of the first month and filled in this further, further survey feedback. Now look at the fact and say, oh wow, look, we're getting all nines, fantastic team, well done, let's all go away and pat ourselves on the back. I say, gee guys, we only have 8.9 for social. 8.9 for the audio CD. Why are we down on these two areas? We're aiming to the best we can be. Theoretically, if we're the best we can be at everything, that's your flat line of maximum satisfaction. Now, I'm willing to accept that we can't have 100% satisfaction on equipment. 97% means we bought and laid out our club pretty well. But the 8.9 on social, I think, guys, we've got to work harder on where social interaction is occurring. I tell you that this particular graph I'm showing, when I studied this graph, we went away and re-recorded our audio CD. Uh, I can tell you that next year's graph will probably have 95% satisfaction because we spent a lot of time redoing our audio CD to educate our clients. We look at all the feedback and we say, great, what's hot and what's not? We aim on our weaknesses and we make them our strengths. So yes, there is value in getting positive feedback. And there's value in getting not as positive feedback. And without doubt, it's great to have complaining customers. But if we know the majority of complaints are really expressions of personal failure, by making people successful, we don't get complaints anymore. So we have to look at their positive feedback for clues as what we can do even better. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we have one more question here, um, and this one comes to us from Christine. It says, we are known for our prices being the lowest in our area. For us, it has really worked in getting new members every day as we are up against big box clubs. From a marketing standpoint, how else can we market our facilities if we don't advertise our low prices? We considered a mid-sized health club, about 14,000 square feet. 
I hand it to you, Erin. We had a little bandwidth interruption there for a moment. Yep, We're using no. web technology sometimes. Can no you worries. repeat that question? Please? Sure. Um, we are known for our prices being the lowest in our area. For us, it has really worked in getting new members every day as we are up against big box clubs. From a marketing standpoint, how else can we market our facility if we don't advertise our low prices? We are considered a mid-sized health club, 14,000 square feet. And look, look, there's nothing wrong with being the best price in town. Uh, that strategy is used by some very successful organizations. Nothing wrong with that strategy at all. As long as you're still profitable, as long as you're still profitable, you're up against big boxes who are offering great facilities and service by the sounds of it, and you're trying to compete on price. Well, obviously, price is only going to get you so far. And remembering when you have a low price, you need a higher volume to skim some profit out of that. If this is an advantage, by all means, you can use that as an advantage. But look at what your competitors are beating you on and then say to yourself, how can we have the lowest price and offer what we're offering? Very often you'll find, gee, we can't offer what they're offering at this price. And that's where the quandary begins. This whole thing about being lowest on price puts a lot of pressure on profit because the volume eventually starts to diminish. So I'm not saying don't advertise being the best price, as long as you can still offset what the other guys are saying they're better at. So you've got the lowest price, better equipment and service, talk about three. But what I want to hear is testimonies from your clients who are reading about the club saying, I'd be a member at any price. Yep, whatever I pay, it doesn't even cross my mind because this is the place I choose to be. I see stories, testimonies and marketing saying, not only do we offer great value, but get much more than you pay for. That I want to hear. Okay, and uh, we have one last question from uh, Lawrence, who um, actually answered the or asked had originally asked the questionnaire question. Uh, he says, yep. "On your scale, then, is there a significant difference between an eight and a nine? Oh, absolutely. Of course, it's about eleven percent. Yeah, for sure. You know." When you are aiming for, for, for perfection, all points matter. You can ask a 100 runner, is there much of a difference in your running technique between an 11 second 100 meters and a 10 second 100 meters? And the answer is huge. There are thousands of people who can run an 11 second 100 meters, but there have never been a couple. I think me only one ever done below 10 the first time it was done, it was one person. You've got to say that getting the fine tuning of a business is measured in millimeters. And so when I get a nine out of 10 from a client on cleanliness and it drops to an eight consistently, not, not from one person, Lawrence, but from a population of people. When I have a population of members, one month after they join, telling me that they're 90% satisfied with cleaning, and then the next population of members tell me they're 80% satisfied with the cleaning. I know we have a cleaning issue. I see a population of members tell me that their first month at the club left them feeling 80% satisfied with their social interaction, and then I can get up to 85%. I know that our efforts to improve our social interaction are being rewarded. So yes, you've got to monitor these numbers. You've got to understand them. But most importantly, Lawrence and everyone else, it's not an individual. Don't be driven by that one noisy, loud voice that always wants to have their say. It has to be populations of people that vote yes or no. Populations of people that say you're good, you're great, you're getting better. And that's why the early feedback is critical. First, after someone joins or thereabouts, they've got to start to see results and they've got to tell you what they think of your club. At that point, they're, they're actually in a very good position to tell you what they feel because they've had long enough to experience it, but it's fresh enough in their mind that they can pair it to what their previous experiences have been. Okay, thank you very much, Paul, for answering those questions. And uh, that's it for the questions. We don't have any others uh, standing by. So um, 
I will just uh, say thank you very much to Paul and just let everybody know if they want to see and hear more from Paul. He will be at our International Fitness and Club Business Conference and Trade Show here in Toronto from August 11th to 15th. And I believe Paul is presenting on the Saturday and Sunday. So uh, there's lots more to see of Paul if uh, you want to uh, come and see him at our conference. And we are taking registrations online uh, by fax or mail at this time. So you can visit our website for that. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to email webinars at at campfitpro.com or myself, Aaron, at campfitpro.com and I can help you out further with that. Thank you so much, Paul. We really appreciate you getting up so early and and being here and doing all this for us. And I will follow up with you with another, I'll follow up with you in an email. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I really appreciate your time and I wish you all the very, very most of success. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Bye-bye.